Welcome to the Farm Jeanette, Bridging the Gap Between Science and Practice Train the Trainer session for Cardiology 1, Warfarin and Statins. Today is Tuesday, September 21st, 2010. This presentation is supported by a grant by the CDC. Its contents are solely the responsibility of the authors and do not necessarily represent the official views of CDC. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Today's agenda includes an overview of the PharmGenet program, review of the educational content in Cardiology 1, Warfarin and Statins, future webinar dates, contact information, survey instruments, and a question and answer session. All copyrighted content included within this presentation has been granted copyright permission. No part of this presentation can be reproduced in any form without permission of the rights holder. The overall objective of the PharmGenet program, it, it, it is an evidence-based pharmacogenomics education program designed for pharmacists and physicians, pharmacy and medical students, and other healthcare professionals. The overall objective of the program is to increase the awareness about current knowledge of the validity and utility of pharmacogenomic tests and the potential implications of benefits and harms from use of these tests. We have the following educational modules available as part of the shared curriculum for faculty. The webinar dates for these sessions will be presented at the end of this presentation. In the following discussions of each therapeutic area and the pertinent pharmacogenomic tests, the information will be presented in the following format, including the gene and or allele of interest, functional effects, prevalence rates, the available genomic tests, and summary of the most significant clinical data available to date. And this information is organized into the literature that affect dosing or drug selection, those that affect efficacy, and those that affect toxicity. And finally, recommendation for genomic testing from reputable ag agencies or national guidelines will be presented as well. So at this time, we would like to introduce the authors for Cardiology 1, Warfarin and Statins. We have two speakers today. Dr. J. Q. Shin is an assistant professor of clinical pharmacy at the University of California in San Francisco. He earned his doctorate uh, of pharmacy degree from the University of Florida and completed a pharmacy practice residency at the University of Miami Jackson Memorial Hospital. He joined UCSF after completing a three-year cardiovascular pharmacogenomics fellowship program at the University of Florida. Dr. Shin's research goal is to promote safe and effective use of drugs by using pharmacogenomic information. His research interest is clinical application of cardiovascular pharmacogenomic tests, including warfarin, clopidogrel pharmacogenomic tests. Our second speaker today, Dr. Larissa or Lori Cavallari, received her bachelor's degree in pharmacy and PharmD degrees from the University of Georgia. She subsequently completed a pharmacy practice residency at the VA Medical Center in Memphis, Tennessee, and a fellowship in cardiovascular pharmacogenomics at the University of Florida. Dr. Cavallari is presently an associate professor of pharmacy practice at the University of Illinois at Chicago. In her current position, she is actively involved in translational research focusing on genetic contributions to cardiovascular drug response. So uh, now I would like to give the time uh, to Dr. Shin. Thank you, Dr. Kuo. Uh, I'm going to talk about warfarin pharmacogenomics, and Dr. Cavallari will talk about statin pharmacogenomics. In terms of learning objectives, upon completion of this program, participants will be able to identify specific drug therapies used in cardiology in which pharmacogenomic testing can be applied in the clinical setting, summarize evidence-based recommendations for pharmacogenomic testing using patient case scenarios, formulate a plan for pharmacogenomic testing based upon available scientific evidence. In this presentation, I'm going to talk about three genes and their clinical applications of warfarin pharmacogenomics. 
and Dr. Caballari will talk about two genes and their clinical applications of statin therapy. Warfarin pharmacogenomics. Okay, I'm going to start off with a case. JJ is a 71-year-old non-Hispanic Caucasian woman who starts on warfarin for new onset atrial fibrillation. Her target INR range is between 2 and 3. Her past medical history is significant for hypertension and hyperlipidemia. She does not smoke or drink alcohol. She does not have liver disease. She is currently on diltiazem and lisinopril. Uh, her baseline INR is 1.0. She had warfarin pharmacogenomic testing done and she was homozygous for the C2C9 star 3 and B1639A allele. Based on this information, what dose of warfarin is appropriate to start for this patient? Okay, currently warfarin is the most commonly used oral anticoagulant in the world. The drug is known for its high, adverse, high incidence of adverse events. It is one of the top 10 drugs that have the largest number of serious, serious adverse events reports in the FDA during the 1990s and 2000s, and its use has been associated with about 29,000 emergency room visits per year, mainly for bleeding complications. One of the causes of this high instance of the adverse events by warfarin is high variability in those requirements among individuals. In one study, there was a 16-fold difference in warfarin dose requirements among patients. This high variability makes warfarin dose unpredictable in many cases, and this unpredictability may contribute to the high instance of adverse events by warfarin. Many factors influence warfarin dose variability. These factors can be grouped as non-genetic and genetic factors. Important non-genetic factors include age, race, ethnicity, body size, drugs, in, uh, disease states, and vitamin K intake. Of these uh, factors, racial difference in warfarin dose variability suggests that genetic plays a key role in causing the variability. Three genes have been strongly associated with warfarin dose variability. They are C2C9, B1, and C4F2. The C2C9 explains about 5 to 15 percent. B1 variability explains about 10 to 30 percent, and C4F2 only 1 to 2 percent of total variability of warfarin dose requirement. Overall, these three genetic polymorphisms explains about explain 30 to 40 percent of inter-individual variability in warfarin dose requirements. Okay. And 10 to 30 percent of the VCRC1 genes contribution is among the highest among the known factors which influence warfarin dose variability. Pharmacology of warfarin. The major form of vitamin K that we obtain from food is vitamin K1. And vitamin K1 is reduced to vitamin KH2, and this form is used to activate clotting factors 2, 7, 9, and 10. And then vitamin KH2 becomes vitamin K epoxide. And vitamin K epoxide is reduced to vitamin K1 so that it can be reused by vitamin K epoxide reductase. Warfarin inhibits vitamin K epoxide reductase. Warfarin is a racemic drug, and its warfarin is three to five times more potent than our warfarin. And its warfarin, so its warfarin is most likely to be the isomer that inhibits vitamin K epoxide reductase. Its warfarin is mainly metabolized by C2C9. On the other hand, our warfarin is metabolized by various enzymes, including 1A2, C2C19, and 3A. Vitamin K1 is metabolized by C4F2 to inactive metabolite. Of these three, of these genes involved in this, this slide, C2C9, 
Vitamin K peroxide reductase and C4F2 have been strongly associated with warfarin dose variability. So I'm going to focus on these three genes in this presentation. And C2C9 influence pharmacokinetics of warfarin. Vitamin K peroxide reductase and C4F2 influence pharmacodynamics of warfarin. First, the C2C9. The gene contains over 30 different alleles. Among these alleles, the star 1 is well tied, producing normal enzyme. The star to star 3 alleles are the most common C2C9 variant alleles in Caucasians, and they are well studied. These two polymorphisms are located in the coding region, and they change in amino acid, so they are non synonymous polymorphisms. The star to allele changes arginine to cysteine at codon 144. This change produces an enzyme with 60 to 70 percent of normal enzyme activity. The star 3 allele encodes for leucine instead of isoleucine at codon 359. And the enzyme that star 3 allele produces has only 5 percent of normal enzyme activity. This table shows the prevalence of star to star 3 alleles by race. About 19% of Caucasians carry star 2 alleles. On the other hand, only 2 to 8% of African Americans and rarely Asians carry this allele. The star 3 allele is more common in Caucasians than in African Americans and Asians. So the star to star 3 alleles contributes to warfarin dose variability to much less degree in African Americans and Asians than in Caucasians because of the low prevalence. Other C2C9 alleles such as star 5, star 6, star 8, and star 11 predominantly occur in African Americans. Their allele frequencies range from 1 to 6 percent in African Americans, but they are very rare in the other races. They have been associated with lower warfarin dose requirements in African Americans. However, the FDA cleared warfarin pharmacogenomic tests do not genotype for these alleles. So I'm going to focus on star to star 3 alleles in this presentation. Then what are the impact of star to star 3 alleles on warfarin dose requirements? This study compared the warfarin daily dose requirements in 185 Caucasians by C2C9 genotype. The patients were on stable doses of warfarin. The stable dose of warfarin was defined as a warfarin dose that produces a therapeutic INR as three consecutive anticoagulation clinic visits. Here the X axis is C2C9 genotype and Y axis is warfarin daily dose. As you see, patients carrying the star 2, star 3 alleles require the lower dose than those with the star 1, star 1 genotype. And generally, patients carrying more than one variant allele require a lower dose than those with one variant allele. Since the star 3 allele produces an enzyme with a lower activity than star 2 allele, patients carrying the star 3 allele require the lower warfarin dose than those with a star 2 allele. Our second gene of interest is BCRC1, the vitamin K epoxide reductase gene. The genotypes of our interest are GG, AG, and AA, and nucleotide position number minus 1639. The gene contains five SNPs that are located in the non coding region. These five SNPs are in strong linkage disequilibrium, meaning the five SNPs are highly likely to occur together on a chromosome. Because the five SNPs are highly likely to occur together on a chromosome, they form two common haplotypes. Haplotype is defined as a group of alleles on a chromosome. The two common haplotypes are commonly called haplotype A and B. And these are five different SNPs that are in strong linkage disequilibrium. Because of the strong linkage disequilibrium, if a person carries a C and minus 4931, and this person will also carry A 
at minus 1639, T at 1173, and C at 1542, and so on. Similarly, if a person carries a C at 1173, then this person will also carry T at minus 4931, G at minus 1639, and G at 1542, and so on. So we do not have to genotype for these five loci to obtain a person's B core C1 haplotype information. We just then need to genotype for one of these five loci. The minus 1639 SNP is the most commonly genotyped by Warfarin pharmacogenomic test cleared by the FDA, and this is why minus 1639 genotypes are our interest. What is the functional effect of the B C1 polymorphism then? This study compared the amount of B C1 mRNA in human liver by B C1 haplotype. X-axis is V C1 haplotype, and Y-axis is relative expression of V C1 V C1 mRNA level. As you see, the BB homozygote has threefold higher level of V C1 mRNA than AA homozygote. So the AA homozygote would have a lower amount of vitamin K epoxide reductase than patients with a B haplotype. Later, it was found that of the five SNPs, the minus 1639 SNP is located in a re regulatory region of the weak C1 gene, and the A allele reduces expression of the gene compared with the G allele. Compared with the Caucasians, the weak C1 haplotype is more common in Asians and less common in African Americans. About 90-90% of Asians carry an A haplotype. In addition, about 80% of Asians are homozygous for the A haplotype. The A and B haplotypes explain much of v C1 variability in Caucasians and Asians because more than 95% of them carry the haplotype. However, the two haplotypes do not explain v C1 variability much in African Americans because about 15% of African Americans carry the haplotypes other than A and B haplotypes. Then what are the impact of v C1 polymorphisms on warfarin dose? This study compared the warfarin daily dose in 181 Caucasians by v C1 haplotype. X-axis is, again, v C1 haplotype, and Y-axis is uh, daily warfarin dose. This is the result from the, all of the patients. The AA homozygote had the lowest and BB homozygote had the highest warfarin dose requirement. So there is a clear gene dose relationship here. This makes sense because the A haplotype is associated with a lower level of B on mRNA expression. When they looked at the patients who are homozygous for the Sarvanale Y type C2C9, allele and only looked at the patient who carry a variant C2C9 allele, this relationship is also maintained. So this data suggests that the v C1 polymorphisms influence warfarin dose variability independent of the C2C9 polymorphisms. We know that Asians require lower warfarin doses than the other races. The high prevalence of the A haplotype in Asians may explain their lower warfarin dose requirements than in the other races. So far, we have separately looked at the C2C9 and B-Corosian polymorphisms. This time, you will look at their combined effect on warfarin dose requirements. This study examined the effect of the number of the C2C9 and B-Corosian variants and warfarin dose requirements in 200 patients. Because in, an individual can carry the maximum two copies of a variant in either gene, the maximum number of the C2C9 and B-Corosian variants an individual can carry is four. Wild type means C2C9, star one, star one, and B-Corosian BB double homozygotes. As you see here, as the number of the variant goes up, the warfarin dose requirements decrease. 
importantly, mean the weekly dose of warfarin in the wild type group was 44.7 milligrams per week, which is 6.4 milligrams per day. So these are the patients who require the highest warfarin dose among the CYP2C9 and VCOR C1 genotype combinations. So the CYP2C9 starts to start with three allele, and the VCOR C1 A and B haplotypes are unlikely to explain extremely high warfarin doses such as 15 milligrams per day. After warfarin initiation, how long it takes to reach for the therapeutic INR is also an important clinical outcome for warfarin therapy. This study compared the effect of CYP2C9 and V-coercion polymorphisms on the time to reach first therapeutic INR by CYP2C9 and V-coercion genotypes in 297 warfarin naive patients. The x-axis is follow-up in days, and y-axis is proportion of the patients who do not have an INR in a therapeutic range. So the lower the proportion, the faster time to reach for its therapeutic INR. This is the VCOR-C1 analysis. This analysis has three groups, AA, A non-A heterozygote, and non-A non-A homozygote. The non-A ha haplotype includes the B and the other uncommon haplotypes. As you see, the VCOR-C1 AA homozygote achieved the therapeutic INR faster than the other haplotypes. However, CYP2C9 genotype was not associated with time to first therapeutic INR. An INR value greater than 4 has been associated with an increased risk of bleeding. This study also looked at time to first INR greater than 4 by CYP2C9 and VCOR1 genotypes. This is VCOR C1, and this one is uh, C2C9. Here, the carriers of the A haplotype reached INR greater than 4 faster than those who are homozygous for the non A haplotype. In addition, carriers of a C2C9 variant allele reached INR greater than, greater than 4 faster than those who are homozygous for the STAR1 allele. So, this data suggests that carriers of the A haplotype or CYP2C9 variant allele may need close follow-up because of the risk of anti over-anticoagulation. Okay. This graph compares the incidence of major bleeding by CYP2C9 and VCOR-C1 variant carrier status. There are 446 patients in this study, 50% for Caucasians and the other 50% for African Americans. The instance of major bleeding in wild type, meaning double homozygote, star 1, star 1, BB haplotype, was 6% versus 17% in variant carriers. So, the C2C9 and v one variants significantly increased the risk for major bleeding. In summary, the C2C9 polymorphism influence those variability and toxicity of warfarin, and the weak and polymorphisms influence those variability, efficacy, and toxicity of warfarin. C4F2 is our third gene. The enzyme metabolizes vitamin K1 to hypovitamin K1, an inactive form of vitamin K. The gene contains a common non-synonymous polymorphism, which changes from valine to methionine at codon 433. This change results in reduction in enzymatic activity. Because of the reduced C4F2 activity, carriers of the methionine allele may have more vitamin K1 available in the body, and they may require higher warfarin doses than those who are homozygous for the valine allele. This polymorphism is less common in African Americans than in the other races. Some studies have suggested that C4F2 polymorphism is associated with the warfarin dose variability. In particular, one study shows that patients who are homozygous for the methionine allele require the 20% higher dose than those who are homozygous for the valine allele. 
However, the contribution to the total warfarin dose variability by the C4F polymorphism is only 1 to 2 percent. This polymorphism has not been well studied for efficacy and toxicity of warfarin, and the C4F polymorphism is not tested by the FDA cleared warfarin pharmacogenomic test. There are five warfarin pharmacogenomic tests that have been cleared by the FDA as an in vitro diagnostic device. This test genotype for a total of three loci, the C2C9 star to star three alleles, and either we C1 minus 1639 or the 1173 SNP. Again, they do not genotype for C4F2. All of the FDA cleared tests take less than six hours to complete genotyping. The short time for assay performance makes genotype-guided warfarin dosing clinically feasible. However, turnaround time may differ by institution. So if the test is not available, then turnaround time may be three to seven days. This long turnaround time may make genotype-guided warfarin dosing less feasible in some institutions. The testing costs $300, $500. Currently, Many commercial insurance plans do not reimburse for this testing cost, except for certain situations where pharmacogenomic testing may be justifiable. For example, if you have a patient who are at high risk for bleeding, uh, testing may be justifiable. The warfarin label was revised recently. In 2007, the label began to include pharmacogenomic information. Specifically, the revised label says the lower initiation dose should be considered for patients with a certain genetic variations in CYP2C9 and v enzymes. So warfarin pharmacogenomic tests may be used to identify patients who require lower initiation doses. In January this year, the label was changed to include a table which suggests expected therapeutic warfarin dose ranges based on C2C9 and v c one genotypes. In this table, the v c one 1639 C2C9 star to star 3 SNPs are used. The ranges also consider other clinical factors such as age, rage, body weight, sex, concomitant medications, and comorbidities. So let's say if we have a patient who is weak or C1 minus 1639AA and C2C9 star 1 star 2, then the expected therapeutic dose would be 3 to 4 milligrams per day. Another way to estimate warfarin dose with the genotype test result is to use a warfarin pharmacogenomic dosing algorithm. These algorithms estimate the warfarin dose to maintain a therapeutic INR based on genetic and non-genetic variables of a patient. The algorithms are mostly linear regression models. So the Y variable is therapeutic warfarin dose, and the X variables are genetic and non-genetic variables. The genetic variables that are part of the algorithms include C2C9 star 2 star 3 and v c 1 minus 1639 SNPs. Non-genetic variables include age, body surface area, target INR, smoking status, history of DVTP, and race, and use of amiodarone. So they are not very difficult to obtain from the patient. Actually, they are very easy to obtain. So we just need to know these genetic and non-genetic variables to use an algorithm to estimate warfarin dose. Then how accurate are these algorithms in estimating warfarin doses? There are several measures to determine accuracy of an algorithm. The most commonly used one is R-square value, or coefficient of determination value. R-square value indicates how much variability in the data is explained by a linear regression model. A model with a high R-square value explains more variability in the data than a model with a low R-square value. This table compares r square value between clinical and pharmacogenomic warfarin dosing algorithms. Clinical dosing algorithms contain only clinical variables. 
Here, pharmacogenomic dosing algorithm has R2 value, R square value of 54%, but clinical dosing algorithm had 17%, and the difference was statistically significant. So, pharmacogenomic dosing algorithms may be more accurate than clinical dosing algorithms. Since prevalence of CYP2C9 and v corsium variant alleles differ by race, accuracy of the warfarin pharmacogenomic dosing algorithms may differ by race too. Here, r square value in Caucasian was 57% versus 31% in African Americans. So this data suggests that a warfarin pharmacogenomic dosing algorithm may be more accurate in Caucasians than in African Americans. Another measure of accuracy of an algorithm is 100% concordance rate between estimated and actual dose. 100% concordance rate occurs when a predicted or estimated dose is exactly the same as an actual dose. If an algorithm has 100% concordance rate, then it would be an ideal algorithm. Here the x-axis is predicted dose, estimated dose, and y-axis is actual or therapeutic dose. And the red line in this graph indicates 100% concordance rate. Although many dots in the graph are close to the red line, only a few dots are on the line. So the 100% concordance rate is not high in this algorithm. So warfarin dosages are likely to be adjusted in many cases, even if a warfarin pharmacogenomic dosing algorithm is used. Patients who require a warfarin dose which is significant, significantly different from the usual starting dose, 5 mg per day, are at a high risk for adverse events by warfarin. Then how likely can a warfarin pharmacogenomic dosing algorithm correctly identify patients require a dose which is significantly different from 5 mg per day. In this graph, a warfarin, dose, warfarin pharmacogenomic dosing algorithm correctly identifies patients who require less than or equal to 3 mg per day 56% of time. In contrast, it correctly identified patients who required greater than 7 or equal to 7 mg per day only 26% of the time. So this data suggests that warfarin pharmacogenomic dosing algorithms may be more useful in identifying patients requiring low doses than high doses. The warfarindose.org algorithm is publicly available on the internet. It is derived from over a thousand patients and has been validated in multiple independent cohorts. This algorithm is unique because it may be used to adjust warfarin doses in patients whose genotype information is available before the sixth dose of warfarin. Many algorithms may not be used if their genotype information is not available before the first dose. The warfarindosing.org algorithm can adjust for the previous warfarin doses and the resultant INR values before the sixth dose. In addition, it has an r square value of 60% on day five. Currently, it is being used in an NIH-sponsored randomized multicenter trial which evaluates clinical utility of warfarin pharmacogenomic testing. So let's go back to the case. The patient has the following non-genetic factors which may influence warfarin dose requirement age is 71, Caucasian race, indication of warfarin therapy is AFib, doesn't smoke, uh, doesn't drink, and normal problem, uh, BMI is about 25, and normal has normal, normal liver function, and baseline INR, INR is also normal, and she doesn't have any drug that can interact with warfarin. So based on this patient's non-genetic factors, JJ is likely to start on warfarin 5 mg per day according to the ACC chest guidelines. However, JJ has 
star 3 star 3 of C2C9 gene and fecal receiver minus 1639 AA genotype. So according to the package insert, JJ's estimated dose range is 0.5 to 2 milligrams per day. And the online algorithm, wildframe.org, estimate 2.9 milligrams of a mini loading dose and 1.3 milligrams per day of maintenance dose. C2C9 variant carriers may be able to achieve a steady state more quickly with a loading dose because they have reduced clearance of a warframe, so they may have longer half-life, so they may need longer time to reach a steady state. This is why this particular dosing algorithm recommends a mini loading dose. The estimated warfarin dose, 1.3 mg per day, is consistent with expected therapeutic dose range on the label. So I think 1.5 mg per day of warfarin is appro appropriate for this patient. Although warfarin pharmacogenomic dosing algorithms are useful, they have many limitations. The first, they may not work well in African Americans. African Americans have lower frequencies of C2C9 star to star 3 alleles and the vicor C1 A and B haplotypes than the other races. Algorithms may not work well in patients with a rare indication of warfarin, such as left ventricular assist device placement. Most patients in studies that developed warfarin pharmacogenomic dosing algorithm had atrial fibrillation and DVT. Warfarin pharmacogenomic dosing algorithms do not include all the variables that influence warfarin dose variability, such as C2C9 enzyme inducers and the amount of vitamin K intake. So if we have a patient who is on, on C2C9 inducers, such as phenytoin, we still need to increase warfarin dose based on our clinical judgment. Warfarin pharmacogenomic dosing algorithms do not predict who would be an outlier of the regression line. Also, the, well, the algorithms are unlikely to identify a patient who requires an extremely high warfarin dose, such as 50 mg per day or 20 mg per day of warfarin. So, careful monitoring, close follow-up, and sound clinical judgment are still important, even if a warfarin pharmacogenomic dosing algorithm is used. Using a test in clinical practice has its own risks and benefits. Potential benefits of a warfarin pharmacogenomic testing include a shorter time to reach a stable warfarin dose, a low incidence of adverse events, and low cost of care. Potential risks include adverse events due to wrong genotype by a test, inappropriate dose estimation by a dosing algorithm, and increased cost. Clinical utility of a test is this risk and benefit ratio when the test is used in clinical practice. There are three trials which have evaluated the clinical utility of a warfarin pharmacogenomic test. Of these, the Kuma gene study is well publicized. The study compared out-of-range INR within the first 90 days of a warfarin therapy between genotype-guided and usual warfarin dosing in 200 patients, and the study showed no difference in the outcome between the groups. However, the Kuma gene study is a small one with mostly Caucasian participants. So the study does not provide a definite answer to the question about clinical utility of a warfarin pharmacogenomic testing. Currently, at least three large randomized multicenter controlled trials evaluating clinical utility of warfarin pharmacogenomic testing are underway in the United States. And the first one is expected to report the result early in 2012. In summary, genetic polymorphisms in C2C9, Vcore C1, and C4F2 have been associated with inter-individual variability in warfarin dose requirement. C2C9 polymorphisms influence pharmacokinetics, while uh, Vcore C1 and C4F2 polymorphisms influence pharmacodynamics. Pharmacogenomic warfarin dosing algorithms are an adjunct to sound clinical judgment. And clinical utility of the testing has not been established. So thank you for your time and your attention. Now I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Cavallari. Okay, thank you, Dr. Shin.
I'll be discussing statin pharmacogenomics. Um, in particular, I will discuss two genes in this portion of the presentation. One of these genes, KIF6, is associated with statin efficacy or the ability to prevent adverse cardiovascular events. And the other gene, which is the SLCO1B1 gene, is associated with statin toxicity, um, namely the occurrence of myopathy with statin therapy. Okay, so let's begin by looking at a patient case. DC is a 48-year-old African-American male with a history of hypertension and type 2 diabetes. He denies use of either tobacco or alcohol. He reports that his brother developed muscle soreness while taking statin therapy and had difficulty adhering to his regimen. A fasting lipid profile is done and shows an LDL of 144, HDL of 30, and triglycerides of 175. Genetic testing is also done on this patient, and it shows that he carries the SLCO1B1 star 5 allele and the KIF6 R allele. So the question is, is this patient a good candidate for statin therapy? And so we'll explore these two genes um, and come back to this case to come up with an answer. So statins are among the most widely prescribed medications worldwide. They've been shown now in multiple randomized clinical trials involving tens of thousands of patients to reduce the risk of cardiovascular events and death, both in patients who have doc documented coronary heart disease as well as those without definite coronary heart disease but with risk factors for coronary heart disease. So based on this evidence, our current guidelines recommend statin therapy in patients who have an elevated LDL and then one of the three characteristics shown on this slide. So if they have a history of coronary heart disease or diabetes, a CHD risk equivalent, which would include symptomatic carotid artery disease or peripheral arterial disease, or if they have a 10-year risk of coronary heart disease of 20% or greater according to the Framingham risk score. So statins are generally well tolerated. However, there is a portion of the population that develops myopathy with statin use. And patients who develop myopathy, may, they may be less likely to adhere to their statin therapy, as we saw in our case with DC. It may also prevent clinicians from escalating the statin dose and thus attaining the target LDL level. Myopathy is defined as muscle pain or weakness associated with increased creatinine kinase levels, and symptoms may range anywhere from a mild myalgia to rhabdomyolysis. Rhabdomyolysis is characterized by muscle breakdown, myoglobin release, and an increased risk for both renal failure and death. In clinical trials, the incidence of myopathy was only about 3 to 5 percent. However, it's about two to three times that in clinical practice. The mechanism that underlies myopathy is not currently clear. However, it is known to be related to statin concentrations. In, particularly, or in particular, stat, uh, factors that increase the risk of myopathy are those that increase statin concentrations. So these include the use of higher doses of statins or concomitant treatment with drugs that increase statin bioavailability. An example of these would be um, cyclosporin and amiodarone. And then also we have recent evidence that a variant in the gene involved in statin transport, which is the SLCO1B1 gene, may predispose patients to developing statin-induced myopathy. So the SLCO1B1 gene encodes for the organic ion transporting polypeptide, or OAT1B1. And this peptide is an influx transporter it mediates the uptake of most statins, with the exception of fluvastatin, from the portal circulation and into the liver. Fluvastatin is actually more lipophilic than other statins, and it's believed that it enters the liver via passive diffusion and does not need a transport mechanism. A reduced function SLCO1B1 SNP, it's a T to a C substitution at nucleotide 521, 
This results in a valine to alanine substitution at codon or amino acid position 174 in exon 6. And this particular SNP, so if you have a, um, well it's called the star 5 allele, and if you have a star 5 allele, it's been associated with higher concentrations of statins. And we now have convincing evidence that it also increases the risk for myopathy. So there are racial differences in the prevalence of the star 5 allele. Caucasians and Asians have a higher prevalence compared to African Americans. So the allele frequency in Caucasians is 16%. It's up to 16% in Asians, but it's only 1% to 2% of African Americans. And so this translates into about 30% of Caucasians and Asians, but only 2 to 4% of African Americans carrying the star 5 allele. So this actually is a, a teaching point for your students um, in, in that how do you calculate the prevalence of the allele or the number of people who carry allele based on the allele frequency. And um, I use the equation of A squared plus 2AB plus B squared equals 1, where A and B are the frequencies of each allele. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the KIF6 gene. This encodes for something called kinesin-like protein 6. This is involved in transporting large molecules intracellularly along microtubules to their destinations. And the ARG allele at this position, so you can either have a TRIP or an ARG allele, the ARG is the variant, and it's been associated with up to a 50% increased risk of coronary events in several large clinical trials. And this includes secondary prevention trials, so CARE, which was done in patients with CHD, or Prove It, TIMI-22. It's also been associated with increased risk in primary prevention, so WASCOPS, or the West of Scotland study, and then also in an observational cohort of healthy women, or the Women's Health Study. So this is pretty convincing evidence. The mechanism by which KIF6 confers this increased risk for coronary events is not, um, not yet known. There is also a racial difference in the prevalence of the ARG or variant allele for KIF6. About, let's see, 36 percent, or the allele frequency is 36 percent of Caucasians up to 56% in Asians and 83% in African Americans. So again, if you apply that formula that I mentioned earlier, A squared plus 2AB plus B squared equals 1, where A and B are the frequencies of the um, ARG and the TRIP allele, then what that translates to is that about 60% of Caucasians, up to 85% of Asians, and up to 97% of African Americans carry this ARG allele that's associated with increased, increased risk for um, cardiac events. Here's another teaching point that you can point out. That is that uh, very often there are racial differences in the prevalence of various alleles, and you saw this also during the warfarin discussion. And this may explain racial differences in disease prevalence or response to medication. So in this case, African Americans have the highest prevalence of the ARG allele, so it could potentially explain the more severe sequelae that occur in African Americans who have coronary heart disease. There have been genetic sub-studies of several large clinical trials, including the Prove It TIMI-22 study which I'll discuss on this slide, and then CARE and the West of Scotland study, which I'll discuss on the following slide. And these have been shown that carriers of the ARG allele, which is the one associated with an increased risk of cardiovascular events, derive the greatest benefits from statins. So for example, this Prove It 22 study, it included about 1,800 patients who had suffered an acute coronary syndrome. And these patients were randomized to either intensive therapy, which was atorvastatin 80 milligrams per day, or more moderate therapy, which was pravastatin 40 milligrams per day. 
And in the overall trial, they showed that the intensive therapy was more protective against death or cardiovascular events than moderate, moderate therapy. So as part of the genetic sub-study, they genotyped the participants for the KIF6 arg to trip genotype. And what they found is that individuals who had the ARG allele had greater reductions in the risk of cardiovascular events with the intensive high-dose atorvastatin therapy versus the standard-dose pravastatin. And then on the other hand, those who did not have an ARG allele, so they were homozygous for TRIP, they actually derived no extra benefit from the intensive therapy regimen. So what does this tell us? Well, it suggests that patients who have this KIF6 ARG allele may derive particular benefit from intensive statin therapy. However, one thing to keep in mind, as we'll discuss in um, one of the upcoming slides, is that if a patient carries the SLCO1B1 star 5 allele, which is associated with the increased risk for myopathy, then you may not be able to use high-dose statins. So you have to weigh the benefits versus risk with these two genotypes. So there are data from the secondary prevention study, CARE, in patients with coronary heart disease, and the primary prevention study, WASCOPS, or the West of Scotland study as it's better known, that have showed greater benefit with statin therapy in those who have an ARG allele versus non-ARG carriers. Both CARE and WASCOPS were double-blind, randomized, controlled trials. They compared pravastatin versus placebo, with an outcome of coronary heart disease events. And in both trials, statin therapy was shown to basically abolish the increased risk for events associated with the ARG allele. So as you can see in this table, in the placebo arm of each study, the risk for CHD events was about 1.5-fold greater in those who had an ARG allele versus not an ARG allele. And statin therapy abolished this risk so that with statins, argileal carriers in the CARE trial had about a 37% relative risk reduction in the occurrence of um, MI. And in the, in the West of Scotland study, there was about a 50% reduction in the odds for having a cardiovascular event. Interestingly, there was no significant association or significant reduction in risk among those without an argileal, suggesting that those with an ARG allele derive benefit from statin therapy, whereas those without the ARG allele may not. Another thing to point, that I want to point out here is that in the case, and this is a teaching point, so in the case of this KIF6 allele and its association with, association with CHD events and statin therapy, this is what I would refer to as a disease-associated gene. In contrast, a number of other examples um, of pharmacogenomic examples are genes that affect the pharmacokinetics or pharmacodynamics of a drug and thereby impact drug response. So, for example, with the SLCO1B1 allele or that gene, that affects the distribution of statins or the uptake of statins and has been associated with risk for myopathy with statin therapy. So that would affect the PK. With BCOR that Dr. Shin talked about, the V-core gene, or V-core is the target site for warfarin, and it affects sensitivity to warfarin. So that's a pharmacodynamic um, association between a gene and drug response. And in contrast, this with, with KIF6, it's not known to actually be involved in the kinetics or the dynamics of statins. Rather, it influences the risk of disease, and those at higher, highest risk for disease derive the greatest benefit from therapy to reduce that risk. Okay, so let's switch gears and talk a little bit more about the SLCO1B1 gene. The STAR5 allele has been identified as a risk factor for myopathy with statin therapy, and this was initially recognized through a genome-wide association study. The study included 85 patients who had suffered an MI and were treated with simvastatin 80 milligrams per day as part of a larger clinical trial and these 85 patients developed myopathy with this dose of simvastatin. About half of the patients had what they called definite myopathy, meaning that they had 
K levels that were over 10 times the upper limit of normal with muscle symptoms. And the other half developed what they called incipient myopathy. They had elevations in their CK levels. They had some elevations in liver enzymes, but they may not have had any muscle symptoms. So they compared the genotypes of these 85 cases with myopathy to 90 controls who were matched by age, sex, and renal function. They also received simvastatin 80 milligrams as part of this, this clinical trial, but they tolerated it well without any myopathy or increase in CK levels. The investigators genotyped cases and controls for about 300,000 variants across the genome. And of these 300,000 variants, only one, the star 5 allele, was associated with myopathy. And they found that the odds for developing myopathy with the heterozygous genotype, so having a single star 5 allele, was about 4.5 fold higher than not having the allele. And if you had two alleles, if you were homozygous for star 5, you had nearly a 17 fold or greater odds of developing myopathy with statin therapy. They confirmed these results in a second population of about 10,000 patients in the heart protection study. The star 5 allele was much more prevalent among the small number of patients who developed myopathy versus the rest of the patients in the trial. And these patients received simvastatin 40 milligrams per day in the heart protection study. And then more recently, the star 5 allele was associated with less severe side effects, leading to statin discontinuation. So for this particular study, they examined the association between the star 5 allele and a composite of adverse events. And what was included in that composite was discontinuing statin for any reason, um, developing myalgia or muscle cramps regardless of what the CK level was, or having a CK greater than three times the upper limit of normal. They included about 500 total patients who were randomized to either simvastatin, pravastatin, or atorvastatin, and they found that the star 5 allele increased the odds of the composite adverse event by about two-fold. And what's interesting is that they found those in the simvastatin group had the greatest risk for myopathy with the star 5 allele, and the weakest association was with pravastatin. So it's interesting because it suggests that perhaps the risk with the star 5 allele may vary by the particular statin that's used. So there is testing available for the SLCO1B1 star 5 allele in the KIF6 genotype. They're commercially available. You can actually easily find them if you search the Internet. And the cost is listed about 500 each. There are currently no recommendations regarding testing for either one of these genotypes at this time. So let's go back to our case. So DC has the star 5 allele of the SLCO1B1 genotype. So this is associated with um, increased statin concentrations and with an increased risk for myopathy. So he's at greater risk for developing myopathy, and this could perhaps explain why his brother got myopathy. He may also carry this allele. So we would want to avoid starting statins at high doses. We could start at lower doses and see how he tolerates it and then titrate it up as needed. We also would want to avoid any drugs that might increase statin bioavailability, um, if at all possible, in this patient, so particularly with um, amiodarone and, and cyclosporine. Also, if he does develop myopathy with the initial statin that's chosen, then we can switch to a different one. Perhaps we could try pravastatin, or if that didn't work, then fluvastatin might be an option since it does not rely on the um, OAT1B1 transporter to enter the liver. DC also has the KIF6 ARG allele. This suggests he's at an increased risk for cardiovascular events, and thus he is a good candidate for statin therapy to reduce this risk. So he should be tried on a statin. We should have to recognize that um, he is at risk for myopathy and monitor him for this. The clinical utility of testing has not been established. There is, interestingly, a trial that is either started or recently going to start that will determine whether knowledge of having the KIF6 genotype could improve adherence to statins. There are data that about 40 to 50 percent of patients who are prescribed a statin 
are non-adherent to it at six month time point, and the adherence level is even lower at two years. So the study will test whether if they know they're at increased risk for events and that statins may be particularly beneficial, will they be more likely to um, use their drug. The SLCO1B1 and KF6 genes are associated with inter-individual variability in both statin pharmacokinetics as well as the risk for adverse events. Um, and also in the case of KIF6 with the um, uh, potential benefits with statin therapy. So with the SLCO1B1 star 5 allele, it increases the risk for myopathy. Genetic testing could be warranted in a patient with a family history of myopathy, such as in our patient in the case. And testing for the KIF6 variant may be useful in identifying patients at high risk for cardiovascular events who um, would, would be ideal candidates for statin therapy and potentially for intensive statin therapy. This may also help if you're trying to decide, maybe for primary prevention, whether or not a statin is warranted in a patient. Okay, well, thank you for your attention. Hello, is there anyone else there? Yes. Hi, thank you. Um, I think we were muting um, my own phone. So here we want to thank you uh, for Dr. Shin and Dr. Cavallari for your presentation. We will continue with the webinar by highlighting some logistic information as well as future webinar dates. If you have general questions, please contact us at pharmacogenomics at ucsd.edu. If you have specific questions or comments about our farm genetic training for health professional schools, please contact our director for this part of the program, Dr. Kelly Lee. If you have questions or comments about the overall program, please contact me, Grace Kuo. We want to acknowledge CDC for giving us this grant funding, and we also want to acknowledge our faculty staff at UCSD, consultants, and reviewers for making this presentation possible. Here is a list of our webinar dates. Of the ones that are completed already, if you're interested, you can certainly log on to our website to view the video videocast. If you had signed up to be trained in these um, modules, and uh, you will be able to obtain all the materials, including the slide set, the handouts, the questions, and questions and answers. Our next webinar date is this coming Thursday at the same time. The following one is about economics issue in October. We also plan to have Psychiatry Module 1 on depression, also scheduled in October. The, the asthma module um, is tentatively scheduled to be sometime in October after the 21st. If you haven't already registered, we encourage you to do so by logging into our website. The program implementation will be evaluated using survey tools. So all of you will be asked to complete a post-training survey. These survey materials will be mailed to you after the completion of all the webinars uh, sometime in October. Now we would like to mute our audience and start our Q&A session. If you have any questions, you can ask in two ways. One is to ask uh, verbally through the phone. The other is if you prefer to write and send the chat Using the chat feature online, you are welcome to do so as well. The conference has been unmuted. We ask the speakers to repeat the question if you can, and this is still being recorded.
Well, this is Ron Reed from UBC. I was just wondering, is there a car Cardiology uh, 2 um, webinar coming this Thursday? Or Yes, this Thursday? Yes. So the Cardiology uh, 2 session will be about clopidogrel and beta blockers, and our right. two speakers will also serve as the uh, speaker for the Thursday session. I, I have one more question. I was just wondering why uh, the haplotype was bought up under warfarin um, uh, warfarin therapy, the haplotype for the VKOR C1, uh, it, 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 it doesn't really seem to make any any difference or, or any relevance here. Dr. Shin, would you like to take that one and please repeat the question? Okay, I'll repeat the question. Why uh, is the haplotype, the A and B haplotypes used at the be at the beginning of the VKOR C1 uh, discussion when it really doesn't make much difference? PKRA has the the 16 it's the minus 1639 position that seems to be most relevant, and haplotype A has the A allele, and haplotype B has the G allele. And I was just wondering why why it, it, the other positions don't seem to be relevant. At least haven't the, the importance hasn't been stressed. Well, the reason for me to talk about the haplotype is historically. The VCRC1 polymorphism, but this that's the way the VCRC1 polymorphism has been associated with the warfarin uh, dose variability. So initially, these five units are all associated with the outcome, and they developed, they discover that they are they form strong half uh, strong uh, link to the equilibrium and form a strong haplotype. So later, actually, they looked at which one is actually the one that causes functional effect. And they discovered the minus 1639 yeah. genotype gene and polymorphism is the one that actually influenced the um, dose variability. So, right. so these days probably is good to say minus 1639 SNP only, or possibly possibly 1173 SNP as well, because those two are genotyped by the uh, warfarin pharmacogenomic test cleared by the FDA. Right. But I talked about haplotype because of the historical uh, context that was initially uh, the drive that discovered this genetic polymorphism that is associated with warfarin dose variability. Great. Thank you. And if I can add something there, occasionally you will see um, investigators report some of the other alleles. Um, I think predominantly now they report the minus 1639 and 1173 alleles, but occasionally you'll see 1542 reported as well. And while it doesn't appear that it has functional significance, since it's in such strong LD with the others, particularly in Caucasians, some investigators report that. So that does also provide some insight into why you might see investigators report some of these other alleles occasionally. Actually, some of the algorithms include the other SNPs that mm -hmm. form the haplotype other than A and B. So still there are some inf information that said, suggests that the other haplotypes are important in determining warfarin dose in some of the populations. And I have a question about here, the, what is the status of insurance companies covering this form of genetic testing when there is a clear evidence that is helped with patient management? Um, the insurance companies generally look for clinical utility data of the genetic testing. Since we don't have uh, the evidence, clear evidence that the warfarin pharmacogenetic testing is clinically utility, useful in clinical practice, they usually do not reimburse for the cost of um, warfarin pharmacogenomic testing. But also it depends on, the, I think, insurance plans, some plans cover that uh, insurance uh, the testing cost if it can be justifiable. And also CMS does not cover warfarin pharmacogenetic testing in general in clinical practice, but they do cover the warfarin pharmacogenomic testing for the patient who participate in a randomized controlled trial that compare, that basically evaluate clinical utility of uh, warfarin pharmacogenomic testing.
Again, please feel free to ask questions either uh, via the phone or by typing through the chat. Well, again, we want to thank Dr. Shin and Dr. Cavallari uh, for giving us this presentation. At this time, we would like to stop the recording. I also want to thank everyone for your attention. If you think of additional questions, uh, you can email us at pharmacogenomics at ucsd.edu. Thank you all. Take care now. We hope to see you on Thursday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please stand by.